A few days ago, the New York Times wrote, three and a half years ago, the New York Times Magazine published the 1619 Project. It argued that 1619, the year of the first slave ship, it's widely believed to have arrived in what is now the United States, was as foundational to America as the year 1776, and that the legacy of chattel slavery still shapes our society. Today, the 1619 Project premieres as a documentary series on Hulu. The New York Times spoke to the 1619 Project's creator, Nicole Hannah-Jones, about what went into the documentary and how the events of the past few years, like the pandemic and racial justice protests, shaped it. Social justice protests? You mean riots? But I digress. By the way, Hannah Jones is not a historian. She is a New York Times journalist, and many parts of her essay have been debunked as flat out wrong, particularly the notion that the American Revolution was fought to protect slavery. I've been thinking about the year 1619 since I was 15 years old, uh, thinking about it both as a, a historic event, but also the power of erasure. My high school offered a one semester black studies course, and in that course, my teacher, Mr. Ray Dow, put a book in my hand by Lerone Bennett called Before the Mayflower. And when I first saw the date 1619, and Lerone Bennett talks about the ship that comes on the horizon in Virginia called the White Lion that had been completely erased from the narrative of America that we all learned. Um, in 2019 was the 400th anniversary of that moment of the first Africans being sold into the British colony of Virginia in August of 1619. I now was a newspaper reporter at the New York Times and I really wanted to use that moment and that anniversary to put the year 1619 into our national lexicon, but more importantly, to force us to grapple with what it means that slavery is one of the oldest institutions in our country, that few things outdate uh, African slavery, and yet we've treated this as a marginal story. So at its heart, the 1619 Project is the story of America told through the lens of slavery and the black people who built so much of this country, but get credit for building very little. Now, before we get into the interview, get this. The head of the American Historical Society, a man named Professor James Sweet of the University of Wisconsin, before groveling and taking it all back, made two major criticisms about Hannah Jones's 1619 piece. First, Professor Sweet said, we ought not view things through the prison of contemporary social justice issues, issues like race, gender, sexuality, nationalism, capitalism. We ought not view that through the prisons of today's view. He called this practice presentism. Second, he criticized the 1619 Project's notion that slavery is America's original sin, pointing out that at a single slaving site he visited in Ghana, less than 1% of the Africans passing through that site arrived in North America, with the other 99% shipped to Latin America and to the Caribbean, end of quote. After being hammered for his criticism and being called racist, Sweet issued an apology. He apologized for, quote unquote, causing harm, for quote unquote, damage to colleagues, the discipline and the historical society. For quote unquote, I take full responsibility. Quote unquote, I am deeply sorry. Quote unquote, I sincerely regret. Quote unquote, it was not my intention. And finally he said, quote, I hope to redeem myself. I have sinned against you, my Lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain until it is in the seas of God's forgetfulness. So here's a part of the interview the New York Times conducted with Hannah Jones. Times. American slavery ended generations ago, but one of the project's arguments is that slavery's legacy is still very much with us. Where do you see that most clearly? Hannah Jones. Every episode in the doc is about modern America. It is following and it's taking on some institution or aspect of modern American life and then showing how slavery has shaped that institution. There's a theme throughout the series. Black people suffer the most from the legacy of slavery, but most Americans suffer from it to some degree. In one episode, we talk about how capitalism in the U.S. was shaped largely by chattel slavery and the exploitation of labor even when workers are paid. And it hurts all of us, she says, because we have accepted inequalities 
in America, particularly among workers, no matter their race. Wow. So capitalism, bad. When you see around the globe the maldistribution of wealth, the, the desperate plight of millions of people in underdeveloped countries, uh, when you see so few haves and so many have-nots, when you, when you see the greed and the concentration of power within, don't, aren't you ever, did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism? And whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. <laughs> this, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. And what does reward virtue? You think the uh, communist commissar rewards virtue? You think a Hitler rewards virtue? You think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that. <laughs> Back to the New York Times interview. Times. One way I've heard experts describe this is that politicians and other elites have used racist language and policies to divide white working class and black working class people who would otherwise share a common cause. Is that what you're speaking to? Hannah Jones, yes. An expert historian, Robin D.G. Kelly, talks in the capitalism episode about how modern ideology around race was created to divide white laborers like indentured servants from enslaved black people and black people overall. The white landed elite was exploiting all of these people, end of quote. Wow. Never mind that blacks captured other blacks in Africa and sold them to white European and Arab slavers. This is what a Nigerian novelist wrote about her father telling her a story about her great-grandfather. Here's what she said, quote, records from the transatlantic slave trade database directed by historian David Eltis at Emory University showed that the majority of captives brought to the U.S. came from Senegal, Gambia, Congo, and eastern Nigeria. Europeans oversaw this brutal traffic in human cargo, but they had many local collaborators. The organization of the slave trade was structured to have the Europeans stay along the coastlines, relying on African middlemen and merchants to bring slaves to them, said Toyin Falola, a Nigerian professor of African studies at the University of Texas at Austin. The Europeans couldn't have gone into the interior to get the slaves themselves. The anguished debate over slavery in the U.S is often silent on the role that Africans played. That silence is echoed in many African countries where there's hardly any national discussion or acknowledgement of this issue, end of quote. Her father told her, quote, if anyone asks me for reparations, I will tell them to follow me to my backyard so that I can pluck some money from the tree there and give it to them, end of quote. So, no reparations, says this writer, from Africa for the involvement in the slave trade by Africans, but there ought to be reparations from Americans for being involved in the slave trade 
here? Can you say double standard? Back to the interviewer, Hannah Jones. We know black people are more likely to be unemployed and more likely to live in poverty, but the American worker overall, no matter their race, is generally doing worse than those in other westernized countries. What? Really? This is what black Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson way back in 1991 said. The sociological truths are that America, while still flawed in its race relations and its stubborn refusal to institute a rational universal welfare system, is now the least racist white majority society in the world, has a better record of legal protection of minorities than any other society, white or black, offers more opportunities to a greater number of black persons than any other society, including all of those of Africa, and has gone through a dramatic change in its attitude towards miscegenation over the past 25 years, end of quote. Didn't sound all that negative, did it? Back in the New York Times, though the 1619 Project, they ask Hannah Jones, got a positive reception when the Times published it, it also became a political flashpoint. Conservative politicians have criticized it, and some states have banned it from curriculums. Why do you think that is? Hannah Jones, the reason the 1619 Project needed to exist in the first place is because we have not, as a nation, wanted to grapple with this issue. We haven't? She continues, for those who believe in American exceptionalism, they saw the 1619 Project as a direct challenge to that, telling histories this way, centering slavery, centering marginalized people has always been contested. I think that is because it is very hard to buy into the notion that American exceptionalism and then deal with the history of black people in this country. Many Americans want to understand, how does George Floyd happen? How does the January 6th insurrection happen in this country? They feel they have not been equipped with the history they need to grapple with these through line in all of these events. That is why this project exists, end of quote. Wow. No, January 6th was not an insurrection. And regarding George Floyd, how many times do I have to make this point? The lead prosecutor in that case, a black man, never argued that what happened to George Floyd happened because of his race. Indeed, the prosecutor's opening statement took pains to say police in general were not on trial. The Minneapolis police in general was not on trial. Further, this individual, he said, is on trial. But one of those things that this case is not about all police or all policing. You will learn from Chief Arredondo when he comes that police officers have difficult jobs. They have to make split second decisions. They sometimes have to make split second life and death decisions. In this trial, you're going to meet any number of the men and women from the Minneapolis Police Department who do a fantastic job. They're committed, take very seriously preserving the sanctity of life. I mentioned already Commander Katie Blackwell, Sergeant Kerry Yang, um, Officer Nicole McKenzie, to name a few. This case is about Mr. Derek Chauvin and not about any of those men or women, and it's not about all policing at all. But according to Hannah Jones, this is contemporary America. Being a black man in America isn't easy. The hunt is on. And you're the prey. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, survive. And regarding America not being an exceptional nation, whatever happened to this? If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America Oh, that was so then, wasn't it? But now we're back to systemic racism. It's absurd. 
As to the white male head of the American Historical Society who made legitimate cr criticisms of the 1619 piece only to take those criticisms back, I have this to say. Whoever said compound interest is the greatest force in the universe never encountered white guilt. And that's the elder statement. Now be sure to hit that like button and hit that subscribe button. And then scroll down, you'll see where you can join our mailing list. Why? Well, because every now and then for reasons that escape us, YouTube has an issue with some of our vids. So to make sure you don't miss any of our videos, you got to get on our mailing list. Also, you see that big round donate button? Hit that, throw a little something in the tip jar to make sure we can still give you hard hitting programs. Remember, LarryWithEpoch.com, that's E-P-O-C-H, LarryWithEpoch.com.